Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Esther Nani. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm a faculty member and the director of the School of Disability Studies. It's my pleasure to be with you here tonight and to welcome you as audience members and welcome the panelists um, to be here together for critical dialogue and reflection. I'm bringing greetings from my colleagues in the School of Disability Studies, Dr. Eliza Chandler, Dr. Lauren Monroe, um, Dr. Verki Varghese, and um, some new members of our school, Dr. Andrew McEwen and Marco Shalburn. Some of them are in the audience. And we're all very proud of our colleague, Dr. Adil Abdullahi, as she launches us in this academic year in a panel that is Black Oculars, that is so relevant um, to our school. For those of you who don't know, the School of Disability Studies offers an undergraduate program uh, leading to a Bachelor of Arts. It's a degree completion program. Students tend it from a distance, part-time, online, and they're often working at the same time. They're often students who are incredibly disenfranchised in relation to the kinds of institutions that the Black Oculars uh, series will take up. Um, they, find, they have found themselves in the past, the object of surveillance, and they find themselves on the front lines as workers carrying out the surveillance work of the state. So this panel is incredibly, crucially important for our students in uh, enabling them to think critically about their lives and their bodies um, and the kind of work that they do. Disability studies is often about thinking about equity and justice for disabled, mad, and deaf people. It's often very affirmative. We want to think about dis disability, madness, and deaf but as, um, as desirable and in its most affirmative ways. But many times we have to look to our minds and bodies to start as a site for critical reflection um, about surveillance, about containment and confinement, and about how we can um, resist publicly and privately. The work that we're going to see today and in the series is um, funded by Dr. Abdullahi's uh, Social Sciences and Humanities Connections Grant. Uh, so Idil, you can follow convention when needed. Um, this builds on a body of work um, that um, can be builds on Idil's bodies of body of work that we can see um, in some of her recently published work, including Black Women and the State, Black Life, and her forthcoming book, Blackened Madness. Today's panel is an opportunity for us to be together for critical reflection and for dialogue, to work across our different position, positions as academic, activists, um, artists, whether we're on the panel or we're in the audience, um, to think about the topics that this panel highlights. So I'm looking forward to it and I'm very pleased to hand it over to you, Adele. Thank you so much, Esther, and thank you, Karis, as well. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for coming. I'm just going to briefly mute my camera um, while I read. So again, welcome everyone to the first session of the Black Ocular Speaker Series, a monthly speaker series on Blackness, gender, and new surveillance technologies in so-called Canada. Again, my name is Adil Abdullahi, and I'm the convener of this series, as well as an assistant professor in the School of Disability Studies at Toronto Metropolitan University. Before we begin, I would like to 
I would like to go over a few access notes. If you'd like to access our live caption, please click the CC button. Uh, there are a few ways that you can participate in tonight's panel. Feel free to use the chat box to ask questions directly to panelists and to chat with your fellow attendees. Please note that the chat box is automatically set to send messages only to panelists. If you would like everyone to see your remarks, please click the arrow next to the button and click all panelists and attendees before you send your text. <coughs> if in the Q&A port, um, Sorry, if in the Q&A portion of the panel you would like to ask, uh, you would like to speak using audio, please press the raise hand function and we will enable your microphone um, at the appropriate time. If you need video on for your questions, please message the hosts um, in the chat. Also, Zoom webinars have a question and an answer feature. To use this feature, please press the question and answer button and type the questions into the Q&A box and click send. So you can also choose to send a, you can also choose to send your questions anonymously by clicking on the box below and typing in the area. And we can also repri reply to your questions live or in the text window. It took tremendous effort to bring this series together and we would not have been able uh, to bring it to fruition without the collective work of our phenomenal team of students, staff, research assistants. I'd like to first extend my deep gratitude to Tally, uh, who is the School of Disability Studies uh, Lab Disability Public's Lab Coordinator, um, Apollo, Amber, and Maddie, who uh, are working behind the scenes. Uh, again, thank you to my colleagues um, in the School of Disability Studies for supporting this project. Um, the Faculty of Community and Social Services pro for providing funding support and to Shirk uh, for the overall funding of this series. I'd also like to thank this evening's speakers, uh, Kamisha, L, and Bev, uh, as well as our uh, media services team who are who's providing uh, tech support, Luke, um, and most importantly, our access team, um, the ASL interpreters, David and Rana, the deaf interpreters, Courage and Sylvie, and thank you, of course, for their uh, flexibility. Uh, it's been a it's been a challenge with uh, uh, our accessibility. Also, thank you to our live captioner Angie as well. Now, I'd like to speak a bit more about the series in general. Black Oculars is a speaker series that brings together researchers, artists, frontline practitioners, and community members uh, to propose knowledge ex knowledge exchange and dissemination. The forum will, this forum will advance interdisciplinary uh, and community, orient, community oriented and historically grounded understandings of Black women and non-binary people's experiences with policing and other institutions that function to both surveil and control our lives. In particular, the series places emphasis on histories of policing and surveillance, technologies of surveillance in healthcare and public policy, and responses from deaf disabled, mad, queer, and trans Black people. In addition, the series will bring forth and reveal the ways in which the, the ways in which systems of control are, ex um, are exacted in everyday realities of public life. Uh, this series will generate a lot, uh, will generate a more critical understanding of anti-Black gendered impacts of policing and institutional surveil institutional surveillance practices, as well as pathways uh, for short-term and systemic change. The first panel, Policing Ecologies, Lessons from the Plantation and Beyond, explores the interconnectedness of colonialism at the intersection of policing and public life as they impact the lives of Afro-Indigenous and Black women and Black Indigenous women and non-binary people. The focus of this panel is to look at the continuum and contemporary iterations of police and colonial logics as they manifest in highly imbalanced, <coughs> pardon me, uh, highly imbalanced power structures. I'm looking forward to welcoming Kamisha, Al, and Bev to tonight's discussion, and I know that we will have a generative conversation. I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Kamisha Siblis. Professor Kamisha Siblis is an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology at the University of Toronto, Mississauga and the Associate Director of Training and Education and, in, and Institutional Strategic Initiatives at the University of Toronto, Mississauga as well. She's the co-investigator 
of a Shirk Connections funded project entitled Sealing the, Sealing the Leaky Pipe, Constructions of Mentorship Best Practices for Racialized Graduate Students in the Academy. She's the recipient of the MyTax Acceleration Grant with the YMCA as the agency collaborator and a collaborator on the Shirk Insight Development Grant, quote, Schools, Safety, and Urban Neighborhoods. Her research uses space, spatial, temporal, and race theories to focus on anti-Black racism, carcerality in Black life, and other, and other politics of intersectionality. She wrote the Morris Report, the first impact on race and culture assessment report applied in, the criminal, in criminal sentencing of Black offenders in Ontario. Professor Siblis has also been a mental health practitioner as well as a clinician a uh, clinical agent for the Office of the Children's Lawyer. In 2022, uh, uh, Professor Siblis was named can one of Canada's top 100 Black women to watch for uh, by the Canadian International Black Women um, of Excellence. So let's please welcome uh, Kamisha Siblis, and we're really looking forward to your talk and discussion that follows. Have a few words. Hi, ready? <laughs> Yes, Kamisha, go ahead. Um, so uh, I want to start by just thanking you, Adele, uh, for inviting me and um, and women like me to come and speak and, and for actually giving me permission to just talk. Um, you know, I spoke to you today and you said, you know, you don't have to have a talk prepared, uh, and I don't. I just want to be able to speak uh, really ironically about things I don't know, right? So uh, I wanna thank my esteemed colleagues on the, on the panel and in the audience as well. Um, I'm, I'm here with some dope women. So I, I consider myself a hype man. So I'm just gonna talk, it's alphabet soup, right? So um, stop me whenever you're ready. So I, I <laughs> my talk was going to be called Accenting Black Women's uh, work with social that hyphenated, right? Um, and I want to talk a little bit about the field of social work and, and what it does to us. Um, so uh, the field of social work has undergone several transmogrifications, beginning with white women's charity and continuing to become a pseudo profession and academic discipline, ostensibly concerned with social justice and the dis redistribution of power. Throughout and despite these shifts in ideology over time, social work has held steadfast to its raced and racist, classed and classist, deeply gendered roots. More recently, the bid to be a respected contender in the arenas of traditionally recognized professions, such as law, medicine, and education, has social work desperately betraying the values it espouses um, in order to become more legible and more relevant to its counterparts. And really, it is uh, about being um, taking on, it's about being more masculine, masculinized, right? Um, so that it can be respected. So notwithstanding, the field remains at the bottom of the professional hierarchy, lacking both respect and prestige, because of its uh, feminization, its re relative no novelty, its humanitarian ethos, and its hypocritical relationship with capitalism simultaneously with its denouncement of capitalism, right? And so um, I am acutely aware of how social work um, not only polices uh, bodies like me, my body itself, but also uses me to police others. Um, and that really is uh, the focus of my pedagogy. Um, so I wanna use myself to illustrate what happens to black women social workers who labor there as well as in other fields. Um, if you'll just indulge me for a little bit. Uh, I am a critical social worker whose academic work to date has been centered on you know, race and identity, youth criminalization and marginalization, carcerality, and the spatialization or spatiality of exclusion and education. Um, and my goal in my social work and in academics is to raise consciousness in an unrelenting pursuit 
of social justice for the purposes of promoting and sustaining Black life. I see my research as part of a broader effort um, across disciplines to study identity, oppression, and anti-oppressive alternatives. So my research um, was inspired, and I'm talking about my research because it's very uh, related to our lessons um, from the plantation uh, and carcerality, is, uh, was with working with the suspension and expulsion programs um, with youth involved in the criminal justice system, examining the vestiges of shadow slavery and the impact on academic and the social trajectory of Black Canadian males. So it interrogated the expansion of the Black prison inmate population and the sanctions that allowed for the targeting of such bodies by the criminal justice system and the connections to these, uh, to school ex expulsion programs, as well as the historical mapping of containment with respect to these bodies, our bodies and the bodies of our sons, brothers, fathers. Um, it's a racial and spatial analysis of expulsion programs um, but larger, a larger social expulsion, right? And it centers the subjugated knowledges of academic excluded Black youth, um, arguing, arguing that in addition to establishing a direct path from the schools to prisons, these programs are carceral spaces that situate the prison inside of the school. Um, so what what I talk about on a, on a broader scope is the, um, the ubiquity of carcerality in Black life, right? So Adele spoke a little bit about some of the things that I've done, um, but I wanna just sort of briefly outline some of these things again to make a point because I said I'm gonna speak about all the things that I don't know. So I was born and raised in Canada, uh, interfaced with various social systems quite int intimately as a social service user. I was a teenage mom. Um, I, my, I have, uh, I'm a first generation Canadian, um, black woman, mother of two boys and a girl, uh, works within and at the interstices of major social institutions. I worked in child welfare as a child protection worker. I worked for One Vision, One Voice, um, um, a, a ministry funded program addressing the overrepresentation of black people within child welfare. As Adele mentioned, I worked um, with family law as a clinical agent for the Office of the Children's Lawyer. Um, I'm also uh, in the criminal justice arena writing the race and culture assessments or pre uh, or enhanced pre sentence reports as they're now called um, and uh, writing the first one for um, an, a black male in Ontario. Um, and, you know, leading to it being called the civil support or the Morris report um, for him. Uh, and these are like glad you reports for in, uh, for for indigenous peoples that are akin to them, uh, although um, we're, we can't say that they're, they're alike because of the histories. So I've taught post-secondary, I've taught, I've worked in the, um, the public school system, um, and I've taught in social work, sociology, child and youth work, uh, and social service work. Um, and I've worked both in mainstream and alternative programs and the mainstream um, system. So like I, I, I take with me very multiple locations that inform my activism, my practice, my teaching and my research. Um, and still with all that, I'm not an expert. I'm not a knower, I'm a, I'm a laborer. Um, and so this is, this is the way that, that I embody um, the, this, the, the plantation legacy, right? My, this, this is my, the carceral legacy for me. Um, as we know, racism is about um, trust or lack thereof and being out of place. And I'm out, out of place in all of these arenas unless I am uh, the service user, unless I am the, um, the learner, unless I'm the laborer. I am not the knower. Um, so moving from the front line uh, of social justice um, to an academic um, and what and what that means has been interesting for me, right? Because academia imagines itself to be a neutral and objective space uh, with only self-interest at its core, right? And so it causes a lot of academic tensions for me uh, because I'm out of place here, right? I am not the uh, white 
old male who has the luxury of sitting around and pondering um, for countless hours, days, months, years uh, as, a, as, as a knowledge creator. And so I'm not known as, as, as a knower. Um, so the first, first of some of these tensions surfaced as um, uh, at my academic, at my sort of my PhD comprehensive exams when I was accused of being a social worker rather than an academic because I introduced emotion and conscience um, to my to my uh, to my my knowledge to my work right and so um, these these I'm, I'm taught that these ontologies are anti-academic right and so knowing that the institution doesn't walk the talk um, has been difficult right knowing that I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm reacting to some of the the um, the faces I'm seeing and the uh, the reactions. But uh, I've been told, you know, in a prolonged journey for my PhD by one of my one of my supervisors, a white woman, that I'm not taking the process seriously, um, being that I have been the breadwinner uh, of my family, um, rate, being a single mother of uh, of uh, three children uh, with ADHD having being a black woman having gone through everything that I've had to go through um, because it's taken longer and because I've had to work full time to to attain all of my degrees I've not taken the process seriously um, and so my work And so when I look at when I look back at these things, um, it's it, it's that I don't have I'm unable to to produce in the ways or in the spheres that I've worked so hard to produce. Right. I've, I've listed out all those things. And uh, and the black women on here know that we we hustle. We hustle for basic re recognition and still don't get that. Um, in my time at, at the at the board, being a social worker, um, despite the fact that we are, I'm, you know, I've been trained in social justice. I've been trained um, in in these the, the frame these frameworks. When they decided that they were going to start taking a look at at black folks and the fact that black children are are, are suffering and um, are underperforming right or underachieving in schools they didn't call on us or any other um black social worker they had the teachers right so they had the teachers teach around anti-black racism around anti uh anti um bias awareness training um and so i'm unable to do anti-racist education planning admin right and, and and instead we have teachers uh, running a huge organization with no business uh, skills and little management experience or skill, right? And so um, I can't be a knower in that sphere. I also can't be a knower in um, or as an or an unbiased expert with my black knowledge. So when I go into the court as as an expert witness, I have to prove my expertise uh, and it still gets challenged. Um, so I was prepped for one of my uh, one of my court appearances by a black lawyer, a black woman lawyer, right? And this is how we we end up policing each other. And I met her, and you know, I was um, dressed up um, when we met. I had bright lipstick on, and she said, "Don't wear that black bright lipstick in the courtroom. Tone down that look. Wear glasses if you have them, so that I can look smarter, right? Um, and I can I can be more palatable." Right. And so, you know, if it were glasses, right, how about these? How's that going to play out? Right. So, yeah, these are cute and trendy for my white counterparts, but outlandish and off putting for me. Right. So um, in the classroom, students want to tell me how to teach and are constantly trying to expose my my certain delegitimacy and leverage irrational fear against me. Um, I've been reported for texting in class when I was actually putting my timer on for their for their activity. My non-black colleagues can actually text in class without being reported because it's assumed that they're doing something legitimate, 
right? It is always assumed that I'm I'm being delinquent. Um, I've been reported for triggering them with videos of people sharing, videos of indigenous folks sharing their stories of residential schools, right? And so the policing happens from above and below. Um, students are policing me constantly in the fields. So, and, and then when I call that to the attention of, um, of who is, might be my superiors, to other peers, to people who are, are, are um, tasked with addressing maybe uh, anti-racism within these institutions, I don't even get to be the expert about whether or not I've been assailed against at work. Right, I get um, I get asked questions. Are, are you sure it was racist? Are you sure that was the intention? Um, so you know we're we're faced with the age old um, age old uh, dichotomy between the knowers and the doers. Right, the doers can't be knowers. The laborers are not thinkers. Objects are not subjects, and we've not moved past that. Um, so there's also you know I have. Uh, I can talk about stories about when I was a child protection worker and um, what, you know, I had, uh, was used to, um, people would profile uh, the young mothers in the hospitals. There'd be a, a specific nurse that called religiously when there was a young black mother going into labor, right? And, and you know, I'm sent out to basically harass this woman and she's done nothing wrong but be young and decide to have a baby and be black. Um, and so, you know, the, the policing, um, just, and, and the, and the, the, the carcerality of our lives, um, it's just really pervasive. And I don't know, Adele, if you want to, um, jump in at any point or, and ask anything about it or. Thank you so much, actually, uh, Kamisha, you've highlighted uh, so many critical points um, and taken us through some really important um, things to consider, um, especially around discussions regarding policing and so forth. Um, what happens when we, you know, uh, call on intervention of certain kinds of professions and practitioners um, that ultimately also seek to seek to take uh seek to carry out the same kinds of uh policing functions um you also really for me i think were able to express all the ways in which um while we may be speaking about um black women and non-binary people to some degree the conversation is still very much centered around um men and men and boys so really for us to think about all the ways in which uh, Black women and Black people appear in those stories, right? Appear in those narratives and what happens um, throughout that process. And finally, your own personal um, experience around um, being a service user and, and sort of transitioning uh, throughout your roles and what it means to be, um, what it means to, to, to know or to not know in, in all of the, these different kind of iterations of your life. So thank you so much, Kamisha, um, for all of your comments. Um, I wanted to just add, because you said, you know, despite the fact that we're speaking about um, women, that um, how men sort of get centered in some of this work. Uh, ironically, I um, one of my experiences was uh, with my with my dissertation, having, having it sent back only to add um, my my male supervisor's work um, all over it, right? That he he basically demanded that I add his work in so that he can be cited everywhere, mm -hmm. um, and uh, invariably take some sort of credit for some of the things that I that I was saying. And so, you know, it, the erasure is. Is is extremely um, also very ubiquitous. Yes, thank you for highlighting that. Uh, wow, wow. Well, we can hopefully get into um, some some more of that as 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 we go through the discussion. Thank you for that, um, Kamisha. Uh, I want to go ahead uh, now and welcome our second speaker, uh, Dr. L. Jones. Uh, L. Jones is a poet, a journalist 
an assistant professor in political and Canadian studies out at Mount St. Vincent Univer uh, University and a community advocate living in Halifax, Nova Scotia. She was the fifth poet laureate of Halifax and the 2015 re resident of the International Writing Program at the University of Iowa. Al was the poet uh, in residence at the University of Toronto Scarborough in 2021. She won two Atlantic Journalism Gold Awards in 2018 and 19. In 2016, Elle was the recipient of the Burnley Rocky Jones Human Rights Award. She was also the 15th Nancy Chair in Women's Studies at Mount St. Vincent University. Elle was the lead author of the report, Defunding the Police, Defining the Way Forward for HRM. Her second book, Abolitionist Intimacies, a collection of poetry, prose, examining abolition through feminist practice of care and resistance is being released by um, Fernwood Press uh, this, this no, uh, November. And just really quickly, because I have it here, um, you probably can't see it, so there's no point of sharing it, but <laughs> read the book. So with that, Elle, I want to go ahead and uh, welcome you. Thank you so much, Idil, and uh, we're really grateful to Dr. Abdullahi for bringing us here today, and particularly for um, the way that her work on the child welfare system really opens up a new way of thinking about criminalization and surveillance, as well as Black women in particular. So we're so grateful for that work. I also am going to just connect a lot of various points, or maybe not connect them, leave them hanging out there. Um, the first thing I wanted to say, especially something that stood out in the previous talk was the connection between surveillance and erasure. And I think that came across so beautifully that surveillance is used as a means of erasing black women. Um, and of course, this is the old kind of conundrum between we are both invisible and hypervisible as black people. But I really like this connection that these modes of surveillance, particularly with the academy, are enacted upon us so that we can be pushed out and disappeared. And I thought that came across beautifully. Um, I was also thinking about this title ocularity and thinking about the eye and how often that has been a physical site of monstering for black people, beginning with the idea that, you know, eyes and teeth are frequently cited upon particularly darker skinned black people as this way that makes one's body become dehumanized, right? So that the eye in itself, even just the possession of one as a black person has been used in all these ways to dehumanize black people. And then of course the reverse gaze of that. And finally, just in my preliminary overarching thoughts, um, I think it's clear that surveillance is a gendered practice, but one that hides those origins of being gendered and masks that in a kind of universality. Um, whether that's in the way that, for example, a male body surveyed, a black male body often becomes hyper masculinized to the point that it almost feminizes, right? So you can think of Mike Brown um, being, you know, seen as this kind of monstered, um, King Kong figure that is so, you know, out of control and so threatening that he therefore must be killed, in other words, emasculated. And then the ways that these gendered practices surveillance particularly are enacted upon Black women. Some practical examples are, of course, things like facial recognition technologies that misidentify Black women specifically at extremely high rates. Um, so we can think of those practical things, as well as um, the very notion of who is watched and gazed upon, who is entered and violated by that, which becomes in a patriarchal settler colonial society, a very feminizing act as well to be looked upon. Uh, you know, women as coded as feminine are there to be looked at. And one other practice I'll cite in this kind of strain of thought is the notions of monitoring bracelets, for example, which are becoming more and more common in both the criminal justice system and the crimmigration system, which are largely, of course, funded by the Black women who support men. Um, and I've made the kind of ironic joke of how many crimes have to be committed in order for people to like pay for these bracelets that are supposed to be keeping people safe, which isn't really a joke, right? But these kind of burdens, particularly now of actually having to pay for community-based surveillance that falls upon largely the labor of women in order to produce bracelets and pay for them that are then used in particular to monitor men, black men who are then seen as threats to the nation or to the neighborhood or to the so-called public. So I just wanted to put all of that out here. Um, just to start with some personal thoughts and I thank Kanisha for being vulnerable and open in her experiences. Just some of my own experiences. So last week, the right-wing tabloid named Frank Magazine folded in Halifax 
This is a tabloid that invested many years in surveying me, um, like publishing, virtually publishing my address, everything short of following me around to public events, taking photos of me walking on the streets, showing up at events only to tweet about me, like at the journalism awards, um, coming to my, you know, infiltrating Zooms, taking personal posts off my social media, all of those things would happen repeatedly and largely happened because of my position as a black woman who spoke about policing. Ironically, they were able to reconstitute themselves in their latter stages through the reporting on Porta Peak, which is of course the mass shooting in Nova Scotia, where they were able to constitute themselves as journalists who were taking on the RCMP. So ironically, one week I would be on the cover branded as a cop hater, um, you know, with quotes from cops about how my work on defunding was destabilizing society and I'm crazy and this kind of language would be used. And the very next week, they could publish an expose on the RCMP and be hailed as great journalists. So the very thing that Black and Indigenous women are constantly doing, which is critiquing the police as liars, as corrupt and as harmful, rendered me surveillable and rendered me unprotectable. And then those same people could turn around and constitute themselves as great journalists um, at the very end of their career and then were hailed when they went belly up as like, oh, this is too bad. Like they did such great work. So that's story A. And of course that instituted in me practices of self-surveillance. How I, what, I don't have social media for a reason. I'm not on Instagram, I'm not on Twitter. I no longer use any social media because of that practice of being watched and self-protection. I couldn't walk certain places. Every event I did, I was conscious. I was always worried that I have a student in my class that would take my recorded lectures during COVID and would sell them to Frank or you know clip a section out. And I actually had experiences and this ties it to the discussion in the academy where for example, I would have a guest speaker who might speak about something like Palestinian rights. And I would like remove the video under the fear that you know, this would get me criminalized within the school, this would be hauled up and I would be put in right-wing media. So this also instituted practices of self-surveillance upon myself, which I'm sure are very common to those who are listening who have experienced this. Another experience I had and now within the black community and we know black women are also heavily policed and surveyed within our communities as well, was that following encampment clearing in Halifax, which I know happened other places as well, um, a black cop uh, put a picture of himself online posed in front of the shelter that they were destroying. And I pointed out how this black cop had a long history of violence against women and that he was proud of his violence by posting this picture of himself in front of the shelter of an unhoused person. Um, his father began harassing me. And then I was literally followed on the street. Like someone ran up on me. I was, I was walking on the street to scream at me about criticizing this police officer publicly. And that officer actually tried to get me removed from the defunding report on the basis that, you know, I hate cops and I'm telling the truth about his violence and also his history of domestic abuse. And of course, um, again, this was within the community now. I experienced literally being attacked on the street for merely speaking about, about this man who has harmed generations of Black women himself. Turn to the academic sphere, and we've had a great discussion of that, just a small story. Actually today, while I was teaching, I got a call from HR. And I, of course, I'm internally panicking the entire rest of my class. Why is HR calling me? I called them back the minute I got off uh, teaching, no response. And I'm like, did someone complain about me? You know, did a student say, I hate white people? You know, my course is about Canada. Are people offending? You know, you go through all of that. And then I'm like, oh yeah, I'm on the benefits user committee. <laughs> like they're probably calling me to book a meeting, you know? But that moment of, and, and this is expressed so well in the previous talk that all the ways that our students can survey us, can complain about us, so that in the classroom, we are constantly watching ourselves and constantly always feeling on the verge of this complaint or this removal or having to defend ourselves. So when I saw HR called me, I immediately jumped to this place of what happened? Who complained about me? Am I gonna be removed from my job? Do I have to get legal rep? And I moved into that cycle already. During my academic research, I'm currently researching police animals and the, um, I'm convinced that dog, we know dog bites are on indigenous and black people. So I'm looking at police animals and their use in state violence. And I've been trying to get data. So I've been asking for a bunch, I've been doing a bunch of ATIPs to the RCMP, which they keep rejecting or modifying or pretending not to understand. So you have to constantly go through a process of resubmitting. And they recently asked for my ID. And I was like, can you clarify why you need this? These aren't personal records, these are public records. Um, and then they said, okay, never mind. 
But clearly they were trying to counter survey me and frighten me by saying, if you continue to ask this race-based data, then we're going to try and survey you and you, know, you will be watched for trying to watch us. And we also know that these kind of practices come back to us from the state. And finally, Adil and I have talked quite frequently, particularly in our podcast that we were doing, No Life Left Behind, about our experiences as Black women entering prisons in the organizing work that we do and in the friendship and love and care work that we do, where we are viewed as always a disruptive influence and as a suspicious one. So we are inherently sex workers, according to the prison, like we must be somehow, you know, selling something to the men because it's not possible that we could have a mutual organizing relationship, or we must be bringing in contraband, or we must be otherwise suspicious. And so these practices where we're doing care work that the state does not do, and of course, the state is countered to, and then that leads to these surveillances such as why are you on the pin numbers of so many men? Why are multiple men giving you calls? Are you having sex with all of them? Are you bringing them drugs? You know, um, so all of these kind of questions when you enter a prison and you can't wear perfume and your hair is police. So all these things, especially if you're a young black woman are then seen as your body out of place in the prison and you become policed under the assumption that you're bringing a kind of inappropriate intimacy into that space. So those are a few ways that I experienced surveillance. I also wanted to move out to some larger cases. I know I'm probably talking too long. It'll be like five minutes already. Um, so people may be familiar with the case of Santina Rayo. Um, this is a black mother in Halifax. So this happened a couple of years ago where she was shopping at Walmart with her two children. And it was the first time she had left her home in a while because um, she had just left a domestic violence situation and been unable to leave her house. So she went to Walmart with her young children and actually called her mother and said, you know, was talking to her mother through the aisles and saying, you know, I've been able to get out of the house. And I'm so proud of myself that I'm here. Somebody said that she was talking loudly and aggressively on her phone and they called store security who then subsequently accused her of stealing. So they said that because she was moving through the aisles of the stroller and placing things on top of the stroller that she must be stealing from the store. They not only called store security, but the police come into Walmart. And here we see the kind of relations on property that Ronaldo Walcott has talked about in his book, that the protection of capitalist property here. So the police are coming into a Walmart to police a woman so-called accused of stealing, which is precipitated by the fact that she's perceived to have a loud voice. So you see all of this surveillance working. She is beaten to the ground in front of her young children, put in handcuffs and arrested and eventually while she has a concussion, lacerations, broken bones, she is charged with resisting arrest and assaulting the officer. All of that to say that there is a CERT report which is our version of the SIU into the incident. It is only five pages long and I recommend this report for really encapsulating the kinds of surveillances we are talking about where Santina herself is never interviewed. So her account of what she was doing, I was moving through the aisles to get toys. I had placed the lemons in the stroller. Um, these kind of things, I showed them my receipt when they approached me. It was only when they started asking me for my address that I became curious and resisted. So these kinds of statements from her have no place in the report and she's not even interviewed, but her voice makes it into the report by being this loud, aggressive, threatening voice and they claim that the reason why the police had to approach her was not solely because she was so-called shoplifting, but because they feared for the safety of her children because of how loud her voice was. So we can see here all the stereotypes of unfit motherhood, loud, angry black womanness, the uh, confluence of store security and policing all taking place within a Walmart which also locks black hair products up behind the counter. So I could go on about that case, but I put a pin in that. I also can talk about housing surveillance and this really um, matches with Adil's work on child welfare and the various forms of how these state so-called care systems of so-called assistance are a gateway to criminalization for black women. Um, a friend of mine who is a single mother living in a precarious housing situation um, is experiencing her neighbors, for example, accusing her of not paying utilities. And every time she pays them, they claim that she doesn't pay them. And even when she shows receipts, the landlords believe the other neighbor over her and accuse her of not paying her bills. This has led to escalations such as installing a security camera outside of her door. So now she cannot move in and out of her own residence without being watched. This has included them, of course, accusing her of having men in the house, another iteration of the you must be a sex worker. Um, and in fact, when a male friend of ours, Desmond Cole, called 
to try and you know defend her and advocate for her, this became another piece in the you have men around you puzzle, which of course renders her as a problem within housing. So we know that black women within housing, particularly single mothers, are policed in all these ways from being accused of yeah, sex work, from being accused of smoking weed, from the way that you raise your children being policed, so that the housing system itself, and particularly for those living in government housing, which can move you around, control your movement, uh, control what business you have in the home, which is of course very connected to these systems of child welfare as well. Child welfare, as Dr. Abdullahi has told us so comprehensively, is a major site of surveillance and policing for black women in particular. Um, so they can enter your house without a warrant, they can question about a man in your life, your sexual behavior, what food do you have in your fridge, is your baby lying down enough, and all of these of course intersect with narratives of bad motherhood as well. Um, so these are all places that we experience surveillance beyond our conception of policing in the state that are also specifically gendered. And just to finish off, I would suggest that appearance is also a site of surveillance, um, everything from hair, but also skin shade and stuff like that is particularly put upon women. Um, so women are often seen as the gateway through which the black community as a whole is policed, whether that's through motherhood, through our disrespectful behavior, through our appearance in community, um, through how we present ourselves. We're often on the front lines at these government jobs in the civil service in particular jobs, retail, all these places that Black women in many ways serve as the front lines that produce surveillance upon the community and are expected as a result to gatekeep the community by refusing to speak about abuse or incest or domestic violence or the issues we experience within the community. And we know that when we speak out, we are criminalized and surveyed by our own communities in a particular way. An experience that I went through through the last couple of years when I spoke out about a powerful man and then you know found myself literally threatened within community and people were able to write things like she should be burned out of the community with no pushback or criticism so i also want us to think about how particularly black women's expected silences and secret keeping that is demanded about from us is a very deep form of surveillance that is part of a very violent continuum that black women live with within our communities and that notion of policing and surveillance that's put on us. And often of course taught to us from other women in our community as well, that in order to be a good woman, you don't speak about abuse in your home. As my grandmother would have said, remember you're a lady, which also meant silence. As my mother would say, um, you know, don't wash your laundry, all of these things that we're taught that I think particularly devolve on women. And I think we're almost out of time. So the final thing I'll just say is, of course, gender itself is a surveillance and policing, the monitoring of trans and queer bodies, the um, assumption of femininity, which belongs to white women and our inability to fit our bodies, our behaviors, our lives into that mold. And of course, Black women who have constantly been rendered as male, masculinized, defeminized, also, therefore, that surveillance connects to the surveillance that trans people experience, that queer people experience. Um, so we also have to recognize that the very notion of a heterosexual cis female body is a production of racial surveillance and gendered surveillance as well. So as we go forward speaking about the impacts on Black women, that very construction, of course, is part of the way that our bodies are regulated as well. So I think with that, we're probably deeply out of time. Um, so I will pause there. Um, Idil, if you, oh, one final thing I also wanted to say uh, about visibility beyond the data. So we often in Canada try to make ourselves visible by requesting data, a process I'm also involved in. Um, but I want us to think as Idil pushes us to do about how our black lives and the visibility of those lives and the presence of those lives is not merely scoped by the notion of disaggregated racial data, which becomes like our policy call for everything. And we need a much richer engagement with our being and presence. And these kind of offerings that Idil is pushing us towards through her theoretical work and her praxis, I think are really important in moving our conversation in Black Canada about Black women beyond the idea that we simply need data to prove that Black women exist, which is in itself a surveillance form, and that we can think much more broadly about our lives in community, our lives with each other, our collective lives as women, with each other learning and being with each other that go far beyond these kind of state-sponsored or state um, accepted modes of being as well. And I will close there after promising to close 10 times. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Al. Um, there was so much that was that was said there. 
Um, I'm going to actually let uh, uh, Professor Beverly Bain um, go next, and then we can hopefully come back to a broader discussion amongst panelists and with the participants as well. Um, so I'd, I'd now like to introduce um, our third and final speaker for this evening, uh, Professor Beverly Bain, uh, who's a Black queer feminist, anti-racist, and anti-capitalist scholar. She teaches in women and gender and sexuality studies in the Department of Historical Studies at the University of Toronto Mississauga campus. She currently teaches and researches in the area of Caribbean and Black diasporic sexualities, Black and Caribbean queer feminist organizing, sexual assault, and violence against women, gender, colonialism, transnationalism, and anti-capitalism. Bev Bain is the author of Fire, Passion, and Politics, the creation of Blockorama as a Black queer diasporic space in Toronto Pride Festival in the book, we are we still demand defining resistance and defining resistance and sex and gender struggles um uh in the edited book uh by Gentile Kingsman um and Rankin Bain is also currently working on a series of essays on black radical feminist queer organizing in Toronto from the 80s to uh the present uh and I would now like to welcome uh uh, Beverly Bain to the conversation. Oh, uh, Bev, I'm going to need you to unmute the microphone. Thank you and welcome. I'm so sorry. I thought I got unmuted automatically. <laughs> uh, Ah, me and technology. <laughs> I'm going to start again. Thank you, Idil. Thank you to the School of Disability Studies and to this esteemed panel uh, comprised of El and Kamisha, who did a tremendous job in terms of making the links uh, to gender, sexuality, surveillance, um, Black women's lives. Um, uh, um, the ASL interpreter, uh, interpreters, closed captioners, and other present. I'm truly honored to be present, to think and engage with all of you and others in what is clearly a timely, necessary, and urgent and generative con conversation, you know, which is policing ecologies, lessons from the plantations, part of the Black Oculus series. So thank you, all of you. Um, I am going to be uh, um, brief in terms of what I'm going to say because I think there so much has been said. I also think that um, what is m most critical here is for us to have an engaged conversation. Um, so, um, but the focus that I want to give this, and the focus I'm giving this, is that I am focusing on uh, Regis Kosinski Parkett's death in the presence of police. And I'm doing that within the context because I was thinking a lot about policing ecologies, uh, black ecologies. What does that mean in this context, in the context of black women's lives, in terms of the lives of women like Regis Koshinsky Parkett um, and her life and the relationship, you know, to the ongoing afterlife of slavery. Uh, within the context of, pla the pla of plantations logic, as well as the ongoing um, surveillance and ongoing um, violence against women uh, by police in the context of women who actually, black women um, who actually live in Ontario housing uh, complexes and or who actually um, experience ongoing um, you know, police surveillance and, and management in, in multiple ways. I call this, uh, you know, um, I titled this paper, they say she jumped. We say she was trapped by police and fighting for her life. The suspicious death of Regis Koshinsky Parkett. We were told to stand outside and that's what we did. All we know was our daughter went in one door 
and didn't come out the same door. These are the words of Claudette Beals Clayton, mother of Regis Koshinsky Paquet, the 24 year old Afro indigenous woman who fell to her death in the presence of Toronto police services officers after they arrived on the scene. According to the family, around 5 p.m. on the 27th of May, 2020, a 9-11 call was made by Claudette Beals Clayton, concerned for the safety and well-being of a child, Regis. She said Regis was in distress over a family conflict and her mother sought police assistance to bring calm to the situation. After approximately one to two minutes, the mother and the brother heard commotion in the apartment, followed by Regis crying out, mom help, mom help, mom help, before everything went silent. I begin with the story of Regis' death because much of black women's encounter with police have been left out of the narratives and research on police brutality and killing of black people. And um, we heard L both Elle and um, Kamisha spoke to this. This is not to say that Black feminist writers have not been confronting and documenting the erasures of Black women's lives in Canada for decades. Brand, Chris, um, Dion Brand, Linda Carty, Peggy Bristow and others throughout the decades have documented Black women's history and experiences of gendered racist oppression by state institutions. So this has been documented and this documentation has been taking place for a while, yet it disappears in the narratives on um, policing uh, black, um, on, on police uh, intervention and police brutality uh, of black people um, in this, um, in, you know, in, in the city and in the narratives, in the media, et cetera. As far back as 1989, a group of us, um, including Sharona Hall, who has passed on, formed the Women's Coalition Against Racism and Police Violence to organize in defense of Sophia Cook, a young black woman shot by police. Uh, Sophia Cook did survive, um, but with physical injuries. Um, uh, she was at the time um, in a car with uh, other, black men. She had taken um, a lift and um, police um, stopped uh, the, um, the vehicle and immediately opened fire. Um, she was lucky, you know, um, to be alive. Nevertheless, what that indicated is the way that black women are always, you know, um, are, or are produced and located in ways that are at risk in the context of policing. Um, black women's lives were imperiled sexually and physically during slavery through methods of surveillance, beatings, and other forms of management. Angela Davis stated, as female slave women were inherently vulnerable to all forms of sexual coercion. If the most violent punishments of men consisted in floggings and mutilations, women were flogged and mutilated as well as raped. So the ongoing brutality and killing of black men and women by police continue in what Saidia Hartman describes as living in the afterlife of slavery and Christina Sharp in the wake of slavery. Sharp writes, living in the wake of slavery is living the afterlife of property and living the afterlife in which the black child inherits the non-status, the non-being of the mother. That inheritance of a non-status is everywhere, apparent now in the ongoing criminalization of Black women and children. And we heard Kamisha talk extensively about, um, you know, that prison to, um, you know, um, school to prison pipeline and the role of youths and of um, young people. It is critical to note here that Regis and her mother, who are Afro-Indigenous, have been living in OHC housing with their family. Visibly black and indigenous and living in OHC means that your everyday life and movements are managed through surveillance and other forms of state interventions as, you know, um, uh, you know, as um, Elle has talked extensively about this. 
Idil Abdullahi, in her forthcoming book, Black Women and the State, Surveillance, Poverty, and the Violence of Social Assistance, uh, a brilliant um, uh, um, uh, book, a br um, which must be read if people really care about Black people's lives, Black women's lives. It is critical that this book be read, that the Ontario Works Program, despite not naming Black people as its targets, function to keep Black people and Black women, especially at the center of state apparatuses of control and dehumanization. And we again heard from, um, from Elle in terms of her discussion around the dehumanization of Santino Rajo, right? And the ongoing experiences that she herself has experienced um, through surveillance um, and um, policing and um, the ongoing experiences of Kamisha. So we see that, you know, um, how all of this uh, intersects and interlocks together. It is critical for us to point to the role that policing has played and continue to play in the lives of Black women. Police have always regulated the mobility of Black people, as we have seen in Carding and with respect to Black women. Surveillance and harassment of Black women was and continues to be used against us as a tool of racial, sexual, and gendered terror. In 1993, a Black Jamaican woman, Audrey Smith, who was visiting relatives in Toronto in 1993, was standing on a Parkdale street corner, and she was approached by two police officers who aggressively strip searched her on the street in view of passerby of passerbys because she looked like a drug dealer and a prostitute. And again, we heard that, um, you know, that uh, black women uh, in public space are always deemed dangerous, deemed um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, dangerous as drug dealers or as prostitutes. Um, Maynard in Policing Black Lives tell us that Black women are positioned as drug mules and prostitutes in public spaces that subject them to racist, gendered, physical, and sexual violence um, in those spaces as well as behind closed doors. When 911 was called, seven police officers showed up and followed Koshinsky Parkett into her apartment as she went to pee. They refused to allow any family member to enter with them, preventing anyone from witnessing their interaction with her. Family members heard rumblings, followed by her call for help, then, then dead silence. Both Andrea Ritchie and, um, and Maynard in their works have shown that the violence Black women experience at the hands of police often take place in their homes, on street corners, and laneways at night, where such violence is concealed from public view. Both McKittrick and uh, Catherine McKittrick and Rinaldo Walcott reminds us that we are still living in this context of the plantation with all its logics of surveillance, police brutality and destruction of black life that marks mark the period of enslavement. Rinaldo writes, the plantation isn't as so many of us black and otherwise think or at least wish to believe a thing of the past. Rather, the plantation persists as a large unseen superstructure, shaping modern everyday life and many of its practices, attitudes, and assumptions, even if some of these have been over, over time transformed. So we see that, you know, what Koshinsky was actually experiencing in the context of her mother and her family was within that, was, was immersed within uh, surveillance, uh, the plantation logics of control and management, but of, of violence, and also, um, you know, uh, the ongoing um, uh, lack of transparency that often comes with that, um, uh, that actually leads to the demise of the individual, sometimes in public view, sometimes in private. The plantation with its logic of capitalism, black dispossession, anti-black violence is also a place of black resistance and black refusal. We could imagine 
that Regis Koshinsky Parquet resisted the violent racist gendered encounter with the police in her apartment. It is also realistic to say that she feared they would harm her because she called out for her mother. Why so many police in an apartment with her, with her alone? Would she have been alive today if it was not for the corralling of her in the apartment as a cage animal? They say she jumped. But I choose to believe she was trapped by police in fear while fighting to save her life. After all, her shriek, mama help me, mama help me, was heard by her family outside the apartment door. The kind of painful, desperate yell that signals imminent death as that released by George Floyd, as his breath was violently squeezed out of his body for the world to watch over and over and over again. Christina Sharp says, black people everywhere and anywhere we are still produce in, into, and through the week, an insistence on existing versus black being in the wake. The black uprising that occurred after George Floyd and Regis's death, demanding the defunding and abolition globally and across Canada is testament to the refusal of black people, of black women to not, to exist, to breed and to live. We will continue to say her name, Regis Koshinsky Paquette. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, um, Professor Bain. Um, such a such a great historical um, framing, and also reminding us um, of the continued disappearance of uh, Black women's not only experiences, their contributions in terms of um, social and political interventions, research, the academy, so forth. Um, one of the things that was really pivotal uh, for me was the way that you highlighted that fear, fear in fact um, kills us. The experience of surveillance kills us uh, and, 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 and the fear of that as well. Um, and so thank you so much for that. I'd like to uh, go ahead and open up the uh, discussion so I'd like to welcome participants to start asking questions. If there are any questions, uh, if there aren't questions in the chat already, I see there are a few questions in the chat. Um, so I will um, maybe, uh, Tali, if I can invite you to maybe just read aloud uh, the questions. And I'm also going to point participants uh, to the chat as well for you to have a, a quick review of, of the questions. Okay, so uh, the questions are all in the Q&A function. Um, would you like us to keep only the Q&A function open or would you like the chat open for questions now at this time too? Um, let's go ahead and use the Q&A function. Thank you so much, Tally. No problem. Okay, so the first question is from Anonymous and it says, what do you think about the ways that accountability can be minimized within Black communities? and to a different degree, other communities that experience broader surveillance from white supremacist society slash culture through the threat and fear of, quote, white people are watching, end quote. What does this do? I'll start with that. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Thank you for that question. I'm sure everybody else can jump in. I'll try and be brief, but... Um, yeah, so this has been a particular construct that only, of course, goes one way. So is typically used particularly against radical Black people or those perceived not to fit the kind of respectable, like, polity of Black people. Um, but particularly politically radical Black people who want to engage in critique of powerful Black people are usually told that we are not supposed to do this. It's not the time and place. We've chosen the wrong venue. We've said the wrong thing in the wrong way to the wrong people because white people are watching us and therefore we have an obligation to the unity of the community. Now, of course that never goes towards us. So when people want to critique us, they can do so freely and in fact, morally. Um, and there is never the, oh, well, we can't critique the radical black person. So uh, we saw all kinds of critiques of, you know, like black people in the 
um, you know, like doing the movement for black lives, right? And they don't speak for us. People could freely say this kind of thing, um, but we are not allowed to say, criticize a black cabinet minister or a black MP under this notion. So um, the first thing I want to say is that is a fictional construct that is then used to justify a concentration of elite power in the black community and silence the voices, particularly of those who would challenge that power. It's also traditionally obviously been a very gendered frame because it's meant to shut women up largely, right? That we cannot speak about violence. We cannot speak about, um, you know, the things that happen in our homes, the things that happen in our families, in our communities. Legitimately, white supremacy is a thing. The police are watching, you know, our communities are, but this is our silence therefore becomes this kind of supposed protective veil for our community, which of course it isn't, but is largely used to then silence the narratives of black women. Um, so I think that begins with the problematic constructs of the very notion of black community and how it's deployed as opposed to a black collectivity or a black solidarity, which are the things we are trying to build. Community is very frequently used by elite black people who have adjacency and wish proximity to white power, who are able to wield this notion of community in order to get to the so-called table, right? So I speak for the black community, so you need to give me a grant. I speak for the black community, so I should sit with the prime minister, right? So they are able to use this idea, which then they have to forcibly police the rest of us and survey our commentary in order to suppress our critique so that they can legitimize themselves in that very same white gaze that they will then claim is the reason why we have to shut the hell up. So that's my commentary. Others can add to that. Can I maybe invite uh, Kamisha or Bev? Um, would either of you like to respond? I'll let Bev go ahead. If, if Bev wants oh, you want me to? <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm not quite um, clear about the question. Um, are we asking here, um, because it says, what do you think about the ways that accountability can be minimized within black communities and to a different degree, other communities that exp experience um, broader surveillance? And I mean, when I think about accountability can be minimized, I mean, the, rea the, rea the, the reality is that when we're talking about surveillance and we're talking about surveillance from the state and we're talking about surveillance uh, from the white supremacist and white supremacy and white state, it is there, um, we are not the ones who need to be accountable. Um, if anything, it is um, accountability is something that does not exist, um, not, by, not from police, I mean, you know, in, in terms of when we think about, and I'm going to go back to uh, situations like we just since questioned Steve Parquet, when we think about, um, you know, uh, you know, um, the situation of, um, of Rahul and other women, um, there has been no accountability, there's been no transparency. All of these things happen silently. And in fact, they're investigated by the special investigative unit because police are involved. And, they, and, and the special investigative unit you know, is only accountable to the police. In fact, one of the biggest um, arguments that we've had in, um, you know, for decades now, I mean, as long as I've been an activist and an organizer uh, for, for over 40 years, is that the SIU, which came into existence following, um, you know, um, Andrew, um, following Johnson's killing, is that it does not, that it, it, it was incredibly ineffective and should not exist. Today, we are still saying such oversight should not exist because it does not provide protection. In fact, it's another arm of surveillance. And it's one that actually um, protects uh, the privacy and security of police while actually turning its, um, um, uh, turning its, 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 its um, information and, and data collection on those of us who are the ones that have been victimized. So I think it's really important when we talk about, you know, um, when we, you know, when we talk about, um, you know, um, uh, speaking to, you know, accountability um, and its minimization is that accountability must go hand in hand with the way in which state apparatus and surveillance apparatus are actually deployed against, you know, black women in particular, against non-gender conforming people 
you know, um, uh, trans women um, uh, who actually experience very much the ongoing, and particularly those who are Black and Indigenous, the ongoing um, surveillance and the ongoing brutal, you know, um, uh, attacks from police and also from their um, methods of, of surveillance, um, uh, they, they, you know, there are multiple forms of surveillance uh, methods. And I'll stop there. Yeah, I too was having some issue with the way that the question was worded, so it was, it was difficult for me, but um, I, I do think that there is there is some accountability uh, needed for those who are, again, pr policing us within, right? And so, and it really, it's about understanding um, what the cultural imperialism is doing to us and, and what we what we then are doing to each other. Um, it's about uh, us being, you know, it, it's about really control and, and us being well behaved, right? That's when we when we talk about white people are watching, we need to be well behaved, right? But we, and I think that, I mean, we can we can be cognizant of the fact that white people are watching because they're always watching. Uh, it's how do we control what they see and what they see shouldn't re shouldn't reinforce uh, the their, the cultural imperialism. It should really be uh, an affirmation of black life, right? Um, and so I think I think you know we have to be cognizant of this of the surveillance, yes. Um, we, we are always under the gaze. Um, I don't know that we at this point we are able to avert the gaze. But what what we need we need to be responsible in a different way with how uh, how it is that we are um, how it is that we are performing under the gaze um, in a way that is is life sustaining and life black life promoting rather than rather than affirming other other realities. I just want to add. I just and thank you for that, um, Kanisha and L. I just want to add that um, I do think that one of the ways, and I think we need to to, to, to see what um, a lot, I mean, you yourselves and your examples have also given, you know, um, have also informed us about the ways that you have responded to the gaze, right? We have multiple ways of responding to the gaze. You know, I, I don't believe that that our, priority is about what white people think. I don't think that that's, in fact, and maybe because I've been doing this work for so long, I don't give a damn about why, what white people think. I don't give a damn about what respectable black people think, right? I mean, I think what is critical and what is important in this time is how do we actually uh, work against those kinds of, of, of you know, um, uh, uh, you know, um, logics that exist within us, you know, that, that continue to persist. How do we confront them? Because I think it's about confronting and refusing very bluntly and very openly at, dif at different points. I don't think that it is about necessarily um, being too concerned about how we navigate or how we dodge, you know, but very much confronting because that gaze will be there. Those surveillance techniques and methods are there, but our struggle requires us, you know, to take risk. And taking risk means that we will be watched. Taking risk means that we will be um, um, that we will be sought after. Surely there has to be ways in which we create ways to, to keep ourselves safe, you know. And that is a collective struggle, as far as I'm concerned. You know, that's the kind of collective struggle that we do to. Um, you know, uh, to watch for each other, as you know, as 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 Christina Sharp says, that this is part of the kind of wake work that we do. It's about care. It's about the way that we care for each other through this process. The way that we support each other. You know, we talk about Sus Velas and turning, and we have seen how Black young activists and have turned, have used different ways to undermine the gays by turning their cell phones back on. Uh, you know, on, on the on the bigger machinery, 
right? So what have they come back with is a call for body cams, right? Mm -hmm. So that they then can use that as a way to say that they are being accountable, but what they are actually doing is arming themselves with very direct open forms of surveillance um, um, machinery against us. But we also know that that body cam does not tell the story of what's going on or the truth. So that does not and should not scare us. Uh, we need to continue, you know, to resist and to refuse, you know, the mechanisms, but we have to do it also, you know, um, boldly and um, with conviction. And thank you, Bill. I was gonna add to that too, that a great example that you brought to mind is the way that people speak on monitored prison phone calls. Um, so those calls are monitored, obviously, to survey our relationships and intimacy, but also, of course, to gather evidence. And so since you know people are listening, people often use those calls to say things like, if you're listening, the crown, like you're a racist bitch, or whatever, like, like knowing that the police are listening and actually taking it as an avenue. Like, by the way, you wrongfully convict people all the time. Or if a guard's listening in, you guys need to stop like calling. So people actually start to use the monitoring system in order to say things. Somebody once called me and spent a good two hours like, speaking back to the police because they're like, I know this call is monitored. Like they're accusing me of being in a gang. So also um, the idea that people will often can use this monitoring in this particular way to therefore resist and turn, as you say, turn the surveillance against people. At the same time, um, we often very ironically highlight that in calls. And I'll be like, in case anyone's listening, I am not a lawyer and not giving legal advice. So don't try to pretend that I am, you know? So also using these kind of spaces to highlight the surveillance and say, we know what you're doing. We know you're trying to listen to this call and that you're trying to catch us out. So know that we know, and we're also mocking you for it. And we're also going to continue to live our black lives on this phone and communicate with each other. And you are not gonna stop us from doing that and just try to use this as evidence because we're gonna corrupt that. So um, also these ways that we are able to turn back on that mechanism, I think that's very rich. And thank you, Bev, for raising that. Yeah, absolutely. I was just gonna add to that and say that, I mean, again, because if get the gaze is a constant, we can either shrink under the gaze or, or we can live, right? And so, um, because I, I, I found ways to really uh, grow into my subversion under the gaze, right? And, and I think, again, that's, it, it can be a little classist, right? Because, you know, we need, there are, we need opportunities uh, to, be, to be seen in certain ways and, um, and status does afford you some of those things. So it's, it's sometimes it's hard to say, well, it, it, I don't really care about the gaze, um, but, I think that the, our survival, a key to our survival is actually living under the gaze and not shrinking under it. Thank you so much for that uh, last comment, Kamisha, uh, Bev and Al. Um, I want to move us forward to some, uh, some of the other questions. There's some really thoughtful and interesting questions in the chat. So again, I thank the participants. Uh, Tally, I'm going to invite you to read the next question, if you'd like to go ahead and do that. Sure, of course. Um, so the next question is also anonymous, and it says, first and foremost, thank you for such wonderful presentations. It truly has been a privilege to be here. As a sex work historian, I was wondering if some of the panelists could speak further on the intersections and implications therein of patriarchy, settler patriarchy, racism, mm -hmm. and whorephobia as it relates to the policing and surveillance of black women and femme persons. I firmly believe sex work isn't necessarily the problem, but the issues and isms I just mentioned, as especially as they relate to respectability politics. Thank you. So maybe I'll, um, Bev, I don't know if, if, if you're unmuted because you wanted to speak, but I was going to. Uh, no, I'll mute. <laughs> okay, so um, maybe I'll invite uh, uh, Kamisha or Al, whichever one of you want to uh, begin with uh, responding to that question. Um, I guess I'll take a shot. 
I think the first thing is it's really important um, your intervention to point out that it isn't that there's anything wrong with sex work, but the sex work isn't the problem itself. It's of course the narrative attached to that. So that when we speak about you know being deemed sex workers, it wouldn't be wrong if we were sex workers. If I wanted to sex work with mm -hmm. men in the prison, like what would actually be wrong with that, right? But so it's I think that's an important point to raise that it wouldn't actually it's not the problem isn't that we're not actually sex workers and people are calling us sex workers. The problem is that the very notion that um, sex work itself is seen as disorderly and disruptive and therefore bringing necessary of surveillance because of a contamination narrative, because of respectability narrative, because the way that sex work is seen to violate the patriarchal white nuclear family in particular, that sex workers, you know, they take men away from their wives, you know. So these kind of narratives that go to the heart of how the nation state also polices and regulates sexuality, right? And this is why sex work is so dangerous to the state because you know, that idea that, you know, people can claim it for themselves, do work for themselves, and that it's not monitored either by the family and patriarchal relations or by these kind of legalistic state-based relations. Um, but yeah, uh, to, what was the second part of the question? It was a very rich question. Um, how did, yeah, I mean, I guess I kind of answered it, right? That sex work is a challenge to the patriarchal control of bodies so that of course black women are commodified under white settler patriarchy we are literally always exchanged and always property but then always accused of commodifying ourselves right so it's okay to commodify us but should we want to exchange our bodies and we're always accused of doing so then now it's a problem right so it's this irony at the heart of how black women are, are controlled in all these ways. Our reproduction is controlled by the state. This is a heart of how a white nation state constitutes itself. And then of course, like ironically accuses us of like violating that. But the reason for that threat is of course, because yes, the control of sex and who has it and who has it with what has always been at the heart of this white patriarchal settler project, right? Like it is inherently a project of the white family and how that is constituted as a violent space, right? That excludes all others. So I guess that's the kind of stab I took at that. Hopefully that's helpful. Thank you so much for that. Um, uh, Bev, would you like to add to that as yes. well? Yes, thank you for that, Elle. Yeah, um, I, I wanna add, I, I wanna say um, in terms of when we think about, you know, women and sex work, we also have to think about the way in which um, you know, um, women's bodies and black women's bodies and trans bodies, you know, are configured in public space uh, or in, you know, brothels. I mean, and these are different um, sort of places in which sex work exists, right? Uh, and the way in which, you know, police police those spaces of sex workers. We know the way that, um, the way that public space is designed a space that is controlled uh, you know, pay, by the state, by um, um, patriarchal elements, by, you know, um, surveillance and management, so that sex workers in those spaces are managed and controlled in particular kinds of ways, right? Their bodies are seen and not, and let's be clear that all sex workers um, are not, ex do not experience the same kind of violence, even though, even though overall, uh, it is a space where violence happens. Not all sex workers are predisposed to the same level of violence within those spaces. Trans, black trans sex workers are racialized and indigenous trans work, sex workers and um, black trans sex workers and black uh, um, uh, sex workers, uh, it tend to um, um, actually um, encounter way more violence um, not just from Johns, but from police in those spaces, right? Police regulate public space, regulate places where sex workers are located in those spaces. I remember um, when I did uh, my study on, um, um, on sexual assault and police investigations of sexual assault, I interviewed sex workers, indigenous and black and racialized sex workers and trans workers. And they indicated the way in which their bodies in those spaces are managed, policed, and violated. And in fact, they actually would resist, you know, um, filing complaints against their johns, not only because at the time they would be actually um, uh, arrested for solicitation, but more so that they would have, it, it's the kind of violence that they would encounter from the police. Right, that they would literally avoid having that kind of encounter if they can. Police rape, 
sexually assault, violently beat, and coerce. Um, sex sex workers in those in those spaces. So we see the connection of you know um, patriarchy and settler colonialism because space and place becomes that which is designated, that which is um, white owned, respectability marked by respectability for certain people and marked by marked by disposability for others, and those being black and indigenous um, 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 people. But as we talk about these things, I always want us to keep at the center uh, the, the way in which Black and racialized and Indigenous people resist and refuse those kinds of mechanisms, the way in which they carve out safety protocols and mechanism, collective kinds of responses for themselves in those kinds of spaces, right? It's always important for us to recognize that with these inter interlocking, intersecting uh, structures of patriarchy, settler colonialism, racism, wearphobia, uh, transphobia, um, uh, anti-blackness, um, uh, misogyny, that, um, you know, that there is always a way in which these particular individuals carve out safety collective uh, uh, processes for themselves in that space, in owning that space in reshaping that space in order to allow them to be in that space safe. Just say that. Thank you so much for uh, those last comments, uh, Bev. I'm just looking at the time and I, I, I want to just take um, one more maybe quick question and have folks just be mindful of the time, um, which I think is, it's a really good connection to your last point. Um, and so this question is from guest uh, Rochelle. Uh, and the question is as follows, considering surveillance and erasure of black women, what are the strategies you personally use to, uh, to more than survive, but to thrive? So um, maybe we can begin with Kamisha, uh, Elle, and then Bev, thank you. So, <clears throat> I, I'm still on the last question. Um, I, mean, I won't answer it, but uh, I, I'm I'm thinking deeply about it. Uh, but I don't want to take up any time on it. I I take a little bit of a different uh, stance position on that. Um, but it's connected to, I guess, um, selling self uh, and and selling out and being real, right? And so my my the way that I here for myself is through affirming um, the ways that I exist uh, without um, in my authenticity, right? Um, and so it's really about reminders um, about the ways that, uh, the ways in which whiteness um, impacts me and the and sort of the the things that I take for granted, um, and and really trying to subvert in every in all the ways that I can, because it is uh, for me it it is a question of well being, um, it is a question of um, you know there's this du duplicity right, and and I need to be able to keep both selves well and and so really being able to um uh strengthen the parts of myself that aren't popularly or readily readily um palatable is part of the way that i i take care of myself and survive because the, my survival really is around the is around uh, creating with my being creating the conditions um that allow other people to survive that are allow other uh black women and black people to survive right and i know that again the personal is political i know that everything i do either is uh in in the is either sort of um, fortifying black life or negating it right and so keeping that at the forefront and living living my truth is part of how i survive Thank you. 
I guess this also is the other question. Sorry, I'm also trying to type answers to the questions so that people get some kind of answer. So sorry if I'm like, ah, as I'm trying to also listen and type at the same time. Um, the last question also ties into this, which is also what do you do to cultivate joy, I guess. Um, so how do we survive? I mean, friendship and solidarity, um, I think is the big thing. I guess if I wanna plug my book a bit, like this is what it's about also, like the intimate love and resistance and care that takes place at all of these sites and the great, joy and um, human emotion and feeling and that we share as we do this work. I often say that it's not the work itself that I find tiring in any way. It can be obviously despairing. There's a lot of things, you know, this terrible work that we do, but I never find that to be the source of exhaustion um, because every moment that we are fighting that is a moment of significance for all of us, you know, as we do that work. I find what happens around it, you know, the kind of discourse you get these kind of surveillances, you know, people dragging you on Twitter or, you know, having a white supremacist rag come, that is tiring. But I don't find the work itself. I think the work itself does cultivate care in us because it is care work that we share together. And as we learn how to do that together and learn how to find our capacities and significance and share that with others and find our ability to liberate together and learn from each other in that, I think it's a very beautiful thing. It's a difficult thing, but um, I don't find that in that sense of sacrifice. Um, obviously in terms of, yeah, the questions of what do you do to survive? I mean, I don't know, I just joined this hardcore like running team, you know, and then we go and work out at like six in the morning and everybody's confused because they know me in one way and sometimes they recognize me, which is not for, so they're like, who are you? But don't imagine that I would be like running around the streets at six in the morning. Aren't I like the angry black woman that screams about white people and cops on the news? And oh, I also run, you know? Um, so I think also, that says something though, that you know we are allowed to be in our many ways. We're allowed to find joy in whatever ways and not be contained to what we're perceived to have to do or what our interests or lives is supposed to be. Um, and we're allowed to do whatever we want. And in my case, like I find running an act of freedom. I get to move freely across the like, you know, land in ways that other people don't get to do. And it's something I do for myself within my body. So um, that's important to me, but I think just finding those kind of spaces where we can be. Um, and you know, some ways it's like not a, a mystery, you know, I don't know, play on my phone. I watch stupid TikTok videos, you know, like we can always take that space away and um, like not have that. I think it's also important for activists not to constantly be self-surveying ourselves around like, I'm not working hard enough. I could be doing more. I feel guilty. Like we have to reflect all the time, but we also have to learn to have grace with ourselves as well and grace with those around us and not be policing constantly each other as well so that those spaces become spaces we can no longer share in or love in and trust in because we're so busy policing things. So I think cultivating grace for ourselves and others, for those we love, giving each other the benefit of the doubt and then I think just unconditional love and care is what brings, you know, the most, um, I am loved by people and, and I, they love me back and I love them. And that is what I think we wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't love work. And that is what I think is the most cultivating thing. So. Bev, do you want to go ahead and, and give a I'll just say briefly, you know, I mean, my, <laughs> Uh, the way I take uh, care of myself is that I work against empire. I work against colonialism. I work against, I avoid, I, I do not see myself as part of the institution that I work for. I see my, I constantly work against. I see myself as it's a job and I constantly see my role in that is not of the university, but of against the university, of against the system. Uh, my joy comes from being with my, being in community with uh, you know, uh, radical black folks and black feminists and um, indigenous and racialized people. Um, my, um, my, my joy comes from conversations, from thinking, from um, thinking of ways uh, in which to imagine a different world and imagine that world together. That's where I find solace. That's where I continue to work from. And that's where I get my joy. And of course, we have personal ways we take care of ourselves. And when we talk about, you know, um, how we handle surveillance and erasure, I mean, you know, for being an activist for 40 something years, I don't know that I would have survived if it wasn't for collective organizing and community. 
and 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 um, you know a constant you know um, uh, imagining and reimagining of something very different uh, in which we can all look forward to and work towards. So yes, that's how I I stay. That's how I stay alive. That's how I live, and that's um, you know how I find solace. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that, Bev. I'm I'm just going to really quickly steal a few more moments of of uh, the audience's time. If you need to log off, please do go ahead and feel free to do so. Um, but on the note of plugs and a few things on 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 your book, L, I just I've. They, I found uh, this passage that I actually um, shared with one of my students earlier today. So I actually think it's a really good way. Um, to end. Um, so Elle writes uh, in her new text, Abolitionist Intimacies, out this November. Um, <clears throat> she writes, we don't hold anything back in this work, not savings, not our tongues that get us labeled as troublemakers, not even our tears, although we push them back and get up the next morning to keep fighting on. Because someone has to buy the groceries, put the clothes in the prison box, pay the gas for the visits. Somebody has to hold the hands in court and call the lawyer and visit the jail and take the call from the suicide cell. And then I'm going to skip a little bit. She goes on to say, sometimes I lie in bed and think about the books I could have written, the papers I could have published, the poems and articles and chapters that I didn't give my time to. And everyone tells me I wouldn't be lying here if I had just written those things. But then I ask myself, which life would I exchange for that book? Whose life was worth less than a chapter? And I know I wouldn't choose differently. Just as nobody would choose differently, not if you knew the life that was in front of you, that you had the power to sustain and hold. And so with that, um, I think- beautiful. Beautiful. That's, that's absolutely beautiful. I'm really looking forward to reading the book. Absolutely. <laughs> Again, beautiful. I just wanna thank our panelists this evening, uh, professors Bain, uh, Siblis and Jones, as well as our audience, the organizers for their participation. I want to remind everybody that we do have another session on October the 20th, same time, same channel, um, with speaker Dr. Tricia Hilton um, and the Black Deaf Canada research team, including Dr. Janelle Rusi.